Um, so I guess welcome back everyone to uh, the student machine learning initiative. Um, so we'll be starting up again uh, this semester, doing about bi-weekly. Um, we pushed, my talk was supposed to be last week, we pushed it back a week because of the walls. Uh, but then next week we'll have uh, another speaker and then after that I'll start being bi-weekly. Uh, so I guess that's all, any other technical stuff possible? Okay. Maybe potentially Kabob might come back. Maybe. We'll see about that. Uh, Okay, so uh, to go into my talk, so I guess I have the honor of starting off the seminar series this semester. Um, so I'll be talking about bolts in the machines, but was sort of on an emphasis of sort of this interconnection between physics and machine learning, which I think has really largely been gone unnoticed in the community at large. And I, oh, also I should probably address the virtual people. There are actually several virtual people. Um, there you go. Um, any virtual people, if you have trouble hearing me or something, let me know. The speaker's setup probably isn't that good right now. We'll fix that eventually. Uh, okay. Oops. Um, so just a general outline. Um, so in the beginning, I'll just go over like the basic building block of neural networks called the perceptron. Um, then I'll go into probably the most useless machine learning architecture you'll ever run across, but the most useful one in terms of a conceptual understanding of how machine learning works. And that's called the Hopfield network. And it's really a shame, like literally no one in machine learning, when you go in class or anything, you never really encounter this too often. Or maybe you do, I don't know. Depends on where you go, I suppose. Um, and then I'll touch briefly on the Edison model. Um, as we'll see in a second here, it's intimately related to this Boltzmann machine architecture I'm talking about, and also hot field networks. Um, so then after that, I'll go into a bit about Boltzmann machines and sort of exploring in detail this physics connection, and then a bit about this back and forth between physics and machine learning and how one sort of influence the other and sort of also backwards. Um, and then finally, we'll be looking into an outlook on uh, sort of this connection to machine learning physics and sort of what the prospects are for the field and sort of how the two can help each other out. I guess here's to preface this by saying is sort of the whole reason and the interest for that. Um, and, and exploring this is sort of, you know, this general connection that we're going over today has sort of been a foundational theme sort of that's been starting to emerge in um, in my group, it's on Alexander's group. So this is some work that um, I've been working on as well with Bacha, um, another undergraduate who just graduated, Sarah. Um, actually, we're also doing something with a high school student and then actually some really, really crazy stuff uh, with some people at Perimeter and Microsoft that we did as well, that I'll touch on the end. Um, so it's a really interesting thing and it's a really thriving, a potentially like huge resourceful field and sort of interesting connection for that, uh, but really come clear a bit later. So what I'm just going to start the top off is just throwing up a Hamilton. tone. So what does this, what does this, does anyone know what this is? Just looking at Hamilton. there's probably some condensed, condensed matter people. Isomol. Exactly, it's an Isomol. But if I was in a computer science department and I threw this up there, they wouldn't say Isomol most likely unless they, you know, like stat or something. They would say that is a restricted Boltzmann machine. So you can write down an energy function for a restricted Boltzmann machine that looks exactly like an Isomol model, and that is absolutely no accident. The restricted Boltzmann machine, oh, sorry, I couldn't most probably say restricted Boltzmann machine, just use that interchangeably with Boltzmann machine. I'll get into what exactly the difference is later. Um, but basically, the Boltzmann machine was inspired by the Isaac model. So it's very much related to that. So I just want to start there. So that's sort of where we're going. This is like the first clue. And this is actually sort of what initially got Stefan really interested in this idea back a few years ago, or probably earlier than that. No. Okay. So sort of. The first place to start, of course, is what makes machine learning machine learning? Um, well, it's, it's fundamental. One of the fundamental features of machine learning is its ability to do collective computation. And so that's best exemplified by something called the perceptron. I think anyone who's done a little bit of machine learning is sort of familiar with the notion of the perceptron because this is the individual building blocks of a fully connected neural network, right? So you have a bunch of inputs, they come into this little thing here where you might have some activation function or something here, and then you get a singular output. So collective meaning that I have a bunch of inputs and then you know I get some output out of it. And that's the general sense of the perceptron. And the most basic model is the McCulloch Pitts model, which is exemplified here. So you sort of have something that looks like a weight matrix times some vector and then you have some bias term. So this sort of looks like your normal fully connected neural network that some of you might be familiar with. And then you sort of have a nice activation function here. And in fact, it's basically exactly the same thing you normally see, except in this case, we're focusing on just like a single neuron, a vector. 
Um, and as I said, you know, this is the most fundamental building block. And an interesting fact to point out is this structure is actually largely inspired by neurons. So you sort of look how neurons work. You have a bunch of these neurons and they're all connected to each other. There'd be like, you know, hundreds or millions or whatever, some of the neuroscientists. Um, but, you know, you have all kinds of inputs coming into the neuron. So you can imagine inputs coming in here. And if the voltage is high enough, it'll then send a signal down to other neurons that it's connected. So that's sort of by sending the brain, that's sort of where this model initially came. Okay, so basically what a hot field network is sort of taking a bunch of perceptrons and sort of spreading them around sort of in this sort of format here, right? You can imagine that, you know, this is sort of that picture from the last slide, except now you have a bunch of them and they're all connected to each other. And that forms like the basic graphical structure of a hot field network. Uh, and so the other assumption that you make with a hot field network is that you have binary units on the nodes. So basically, you could just imagine spin up or spin down. Um, and then basically, that just reduces the previous model to this nice function. It looks the same. Other instead of having step side function, you now just have the sign of whether this sum is here. So basically, it just works down to if I go around here and I just sum up all the weights with all the inputs going into one node, if it's higher than this bias value here, or you can think of this as a threshold. You have it spin up. If it's lower, you put spin down. And this actually fully dictates the dynamics for the hot field network. So instead of you know normally with a fully connected neural network, you have some input, you know, you do W times X, and then you go through the subsequent layers, and then you get your output. Basically, you just jump around node to node. You use this function to then evaluate: Do I update this bit here based on what the weights times you know the input from X two, X three, X four, etc. into that is whether it's higher or lower than that base? Sorry, the bias you then change the sign up or down, depending on that. So it's a very, very simple model. So one might say, oops, slide in myself. Um, so one critical property of the Hopfield network is that the weights are symmetric. And the reason why this is important is you can define a consistent energy function on the architecture that, again, sort of looks like an Ising model. So you have the various spins on the sites. You then have the weights. The weights are symmetric. But what happens is when I follow this prescription here, um, the dynamics by that, it turns out that I always go downhill in terms of energy. So my energy is always decreasing as I jump around from node to node, do that sum, and then I you know, update what the spin is at the site, or I keep it the same depending on you know, what the value is of the threshold. And what happens is if I keep track of the energy over time, it always goes down, and you reach what are called detractors. And sort of how you can think of what those attractors are, it comes down to, okay, well, what exact, how exactly do I train this popular network? The training is incredibly trivial. Basically what you do is you have, say, imagine you have some pattern, say it's an image of a cat or an image of a dog, and you basically just take the outer product, imagine you just have it as a vector or something, and take an outer product with itself, and then basically that is your weight. So then you have a normalization factor and is like the number of nodes in that image. Um, and you can do this for multiple patterns, so that's why there's a summation here. So you can sum over key patterns, and you can imagine that the weights are just a superposition of stored paths. But so what ends up happening, so this diagram here is sort of representing sort of conceptually exactly what's going on when you go to use this architecture, is let's say you take an image of a cat that you cut in half, right? So half the information isn't there anymore. One of the powers of popular networks is that they're good at fixing defects because they look for the closest thing to what you input. And so that, that's sort of the notion of an attractor. And so let's imagine, you know, these dots. So here there's just one pattern. The reason there's two is because this is called the reverse state. It's basically just for all the spins are flipped. So there's for every single pattern, you have two attractors. One is just the negative what you input. So imagine if I put in a picture of a cat into the network, it's not going to move anywhere. The initial, you know, that initial what's called the Hamming distance, just the difference between pictures, you like can calculate like a mean beyond average mean squared error. And then if you calculate that, you know, it's not going to go anywhere because it's what you put in there. But now if you put like half the image in the cat, it's not going to quite line up with what you input. But over time, as you run the algorithm, it'll start repairing and giving back the missing information using that dynamics that was a few slides back. And then, you know, everything goes to these nice attractors. Um, and then, of course, you have interesting edge cases. You know, what happens if you, if you go on here? Well, you get something called confusion. Um, so here's an example of what I was describing, but a little bit simpler. Um, so I, here I just trained a simple uh, Huffield network with two patterns. So this is like horizontal and vertical strikes. 
And imagine that I gave this as input. So here's you know, some up spins, maybe these are down spins, and this is just zero, so there's no information here. You run this through the algorithm, and it'll give you back what is here. So quite clearly, the horizontal pattern is what this is, right? It just spins some information that's been thrown out. So running that algorithm, you get it back. But if you give it something that's sort of like on that fringe case, like I described, like right on the line, you'll actually get some confusion where the two start to overlap with each other, which is the bottom right output. So sort of the main takeaway from just what, what popular networks are and how they work is that um, basically you find local energy minima of your architecture utilizing the fact that the weights are symmetric. That is crucial. This won't work if they aren't symmetric. And also that you have binary threshold units, so spin up and spin down. Um, and then also memories, or you could think of patterns or say features correspond to those local energy minima in your architecture that are the attractors for whatever you put in. So that's sort of the main feature of the Hopsill networks. Um, so I just want to come back and do a quick uh, just review of the ASMO before I go into the Boltzmann machine. Nothing too simple. So I'm just going to flash the Hamiltonian up here again. You know, we have sort of, I think most people have seen stat neck, they sort of are familiar with the ASMO. Um, but you know, you have this normal picture where you have spins up, spin down, you know, you can play with the temperature, and then you can go through phase transitions where at high temperature. All the spins are just random and your average magnetization is zero. And then as you cool it down, the magnetization either goes to one or minus one through this, you know, some standard symmetry breaking stuff that happens. So I won't go too much into that. But one thing I do want to detail, because I'm going to use it at the very end and show a very explicit example of how using physics can actually help in terms of machine learning theory coming up with a much simpler architecture. And so that's just by very simply going through how you solve the Eisen model using mean field theory. So in order, you know, you can solve exactly the Eisen model in two dimensions, that's no problem. Um, but you can do it a little bit easy, more easily in two dimensions using just the mean field theory. So basically you just treat, instead of the lattice, you just imagine you have one particle and then there's some effective field around. So that's sort of what we're doing here. Um, so you can come up with an effective field EI, and then you, can, uh, then you can find the solution here, and then you can calculate what the average spin should be. So here you just have your normal partition function, and then because we're looking at a single particle state in this effective field VI, we have a spin up and a spin down state, and this tells us what our average spin should be. Um, replacing the average spin for your magnetization, you can then come up with a nice solution here with this tangent solution. Um, and this graphically here is just showing you, just by plotting basically the left and right hand sides of this equation, how you can sort of graphically see the solution. So like this orange line here is corresponding to where you've where you're in the uh, symmetry breaking state, right? So you have states that are at magnetization one and then minus one. And then in here, this blue line is corresponding to when you're at like a higher temperature. So you can sort of visually imagine the phase transition as you sort of move this line, changing this globally. Uh, but we're gonna use this result later to actually kind of come show a very interesting way, as I said before, of really simplifying um, a Boltzmann machine architecture. So, okay. On to Boltzmann machines. Let's that a little bit. Uh, so Boltzmann machines. So there, this isn't another name for Boltzmann machines, but this is sort of a way in which you can think of what a Boltzmann machine is, given what we just talked about with hot field networks is Boltzmann machines, they're just stochastic hot field networks with hidden layers or hidden nodes. And so there are two types of Boltzmann machines, kind of roughly speaking. So there's just a regular old fashioned Boltzmann machine. So you can imagine it as a graph that's fully connected. There are two types of nodes. So up here, these like single circles here, those are the hidden nodes. And then I said that we also have visible nodes. Um, and these here are sort of are the double circles. And in the general Boltzmann machine, everything is just connected to everything. So it's a fully connected graph. Uh, another type of Boltzmann machine, which is certainly more popular as far as people using them, but I won't really talk much about it today. Although everything I say about Boltzmann machines does generalize to the other. Um, is restricted Boltzmann machines. And the difference is it's just a bipartite graph. And all that basically means is that all the visible layers, they aren't connected to each other, but they're connected to every other one of the hidden layers and then the inverse for the hidden layer back to the visible layer. Um, and the goal of the Boltzmann machine that's a little bit different from the Hopfield network is that typically your goal is to learn some probability distribution of some states of some data that you have. So let's imagine, you know, it's just Ising model data. There's some probability distribution for that data. The goal is to have this architecture learn that distribution for those states. Um, so it's a little bit different than a hop field network, right? Because that you just trivially write down something. So there's really no, not much to learning there. Whereas here we actually want to actively 
try to get the visible layer to correspond to a probability distribution. Uh, and you know, like Hopfield networks, Boltzmann machines can also be used for something like pattern completion. So a common, you know, hello world example for Boltzmann machines is taking movie reviews. So just imagine like everyone, you know, a thousand movies and you just go through and you ask people, have you seen this movie? And if you did, do you like it or not? So if they haven't seen it, that's like your no information, right? But if they have seen a movie, they might be like, give it a one. If they haven't seen it, they give it a negative one. So it translates sort of back to what we were talking about earlier, where in the uh, popular network, you can do this pattern reconstruction. You can do the same for Boltzmann machines. But the reason why you want the Boltzmann machine is because it learns a probability distribution and then the correlations between those movies, which you can't do with the popular network, of course. I guess I should stop. Anyone have any questions at all? Then I think I'm public. Okay, so one, so as I said, you know, popular networks are pretty similar to Boltzmann machines, but one place is where they where they differ is that they're stochastic. So I can do the same thing where I jump around from node to node, and I do this thing where you know sum up. So right here, I can jump around from node to node. I can sum up all the you know inputs from the nodes, sorry, from all the other nodes coming into whatever node I'm at. Um, and then what I do is I do this give sampling step where I calculate this probability, where I can calculate some probability for my spin being up or down. And depending on whether this value is, you know, you could say, you know, depending on what this value is, you can then decide whether the spin is going to be up or the spin is going to be down based on this probability distribution. So it's a little bit different, but it's subtly different. And then again, the dynamics is the same. You just keep running the system, keep running with the same rule. And then, you know, if you put in some pattern that was missing some information, eventually over time, as you run this over and over and over again, provided the ways are the correct distribution, it'll actually return, you know, whatever you may say was an image of a cat, it'll give you back. Does the temperature depend on the temperature set for the or does it depend on the change? Um, that's a great question. Uh, normally, it's just everything. It's the same temperature. Um, maybe there is a way in which you could have the temperature uh, change. And then the temperature is also something that you can play with a bit as well. Um, so you don't always have to be. So there's something that I might mention later, which is a method of training where it's something called simulated annealing, where you play around a bit with the temperature when you go to train. Um, but no, that's a good question. So, um, as you guys will recall, there are two types of nodes in this architecture, right? There's the visible layer and there's the hidden layer. And what our goal is, we want to learn the probability distribution of our training data on that visible layer. So it's important that we know what the probability distribution of those visible nodes are. So I'm just going to label visible nodes by alpha, and then beta are the hidden nodes. So those are ones that don't correspond to the input data. And then basically all the you know information about correlations and everything is going to be encoded you know between those weights between the two. Um, but it's pretty easy to write down what the probability for a given state for the visible vectors are. Um, it just you know looks like this where you have this nice uh, almost you know again it's basically just stat map, right? It looks a partition function um, where you sum over all of the hidden layers here, uh, and then where you have this energy function here, which again is just sort of exactly what it looked like for the Hopfield network. Where you know it looks just like an Ising model, where you have your weights and then you have your various spins, and you're doing the summation. Um, but again, the important thing is we want to match some probability distribution for our data, and the way that we do that is we use something called the relative entry. And I won't get exactly into where this comes from, but you know it's from some information theoretic uh, reasons why exactly why you use this. But I'll get into a little bit later with some stat mech analogies where maybe we can have a little bit more insight into exactly what's going on. But we won't get there quite yet. Uh, but basically, RA is your probability, the desired probability distribution you want to model. And then PA, again, is what actually is there at the moment. And then your goal is to minimize this relative entropy. Because that's intuitive, of course, because you want to, again, match what your data has. And how do you actually go about doing that is you have to update the weights. And for anyone who's done like regular neural networks, how do you do that? You do back propagation. And how do you do that? You do this by taking gradient. So again, to update the weights, you do a very, very similar thing as you calculate the gradient of that relative entropy with respect to the weights. And if you go through and do this wonderful calculation, I'll sort of skip over the, the fun stuff. You guys can look at this online later if you want. But basically what happens is you get this nice equation out at the end, which turned where it's related to the average correlation of the spins 
in the clamp state minus the average correlation in the spins in the free state. And what that means is, in this case, what you do is you hold the visible units fixed at say your data. You keep them fixed, but you allow the algorithm to run around from site to site to site. And anything that isn't a visible unit, basically you allow the, uh, the hidden units to change. So that's the clamp state. And you have to let that run for a very long time. And you actually have to have that reach thermal equilibrium so you can actually calculate what this average is. And that's actually incredibly computationally expensive. And even more so in the free case, the free case is just where all the nodes are now up for grab. And basically your goal here is to have those correlations to be the same in the clamp state and the free state, because that means when I just let this thing go by itself, the um, visible units are naturally needing that probability distribution that we desire. Okay, so now something that you need to we can do is sort of, even though the you know the math is pretty similar to physics, you know, in the last few slides, we can make it a little bit more explicit. So we can take that probability distribution from before and we can explicitly write it down as you know, we can have a this uh, top summation over here. I mean, it's just a partition function, um, except you know, the case where alpha is now fixed. So you can imagine just all this, you know, the various states you can have where you just keep your input data fixed. Um, and then you can write that in terms of free energy, where you have a difference of the free energy where alpha, the data vector is clamped, where everything is just free uh, to you know, evolve as normal without any interference. And then you can do a similar thing for the relative entropy. So you can sort of break this piece up. So you get a constant term from this R alpha. R alpha doesn't change. That's a distribution of your data. That's just a constant. Um, and then you can write down this other term, which you can then simplify. There's just the difference between the free energy of the clamped system to the free energy of the free system. Um, and naturally, uh, the free energy of this is going to be a bit higher, right? Because there's less states available, or sorry, there's more states available for you to screw around with things. So it makes sense that as F clamped reaches, sorry, as uh, these two come closer and closer together, that your relative entropy is going to be going down because you're going to be getting closer and closer to F. Um, I get a sign on that possibly. But conceptually, that's what happened. Um, and then you can sort of, again, calculate the gradient using these same variables and you just get it out the exact same answer. So, it's, you know, this slide's not too enlightening, but it's just making the physics connection a little bit more explicit in terms of, you know, free energies and whatnot. Um, but as I said, this average spin here is, to calculate that is incredibly expensive because you have to reach thermal equilibrium for the, for the system. Which generally speaking, if you have random weights to begin with, it makes sense that they're not gonna have anything to do with whatever data you're trying to look. So it takes a long time. So here's an example of running. Now, this is a different algorithm with a different method that Stefan and I have developed that I'm not going to get into today. But it still sort of shows the same idea is imagine that this is the state, say just the free state, where you know gave it initially a data vector, and then we just ran it. Basically, I have to wait a very long time until the energy, you know, until this distribution thermalizes, but basically means here I'm just calculating the average magnetization until it basically looks like a nice gap. This is very the right way to think. Right? It's same with the partition function, and when it starts off in the beginning, it's usually off in the tail somewhere, and you don't want to calculate the average spins with that. That's usually not going to be a good thing. So you have to wait a very long time to be able, be able to even calculate one weight update, which normally in a regular machine learning algorithm with you know, back propagation, I mean, you could probably train a whole thing in the amount of time it would take this just to do a single weight update. And you can see you know, over time, as this keeps running, it keeps getting closer and closer to a couch. Okay, so why, okay, so there's some cool physics analogies, right? You know, Boltzmann machines kind of look like the Isaac model, but I mean, is that useful at all? I mean, okay, cool. But maybe some people don't think that's particularly surprising. Um, well, one neat thing you can do is, well, one problem with Boltzmann machines, as I just explained, is it's, it's incredibly computationally expensive to do anything with, that, with it. Well, one neat thing you can do is use that mean field theory approximation that I you know, brought up very quickly a few slides ago. That result, which is just reproduced here with like sort of machine learning values and stuff, or you know, static uh, variables. Um, but you can use that to sort of make a nice approximation that actually increases the speed of training up to 30 times, roughly, order of magnitude 10, maybe 100. Uh, and the way you do that is just making a replacement by replacing this average spin with just a product of magnetizations for the different spins. Um, and okay, so you sort of trade things off here because you actually have. That you actually have like n different of these n's that you need to account for. Um, so you actually get a bunch of nonlinear equations that you now need to keep track of, but it turns out they're still more computationally efficient. Uh, 
uh, by viewing our replacement. Um, you can also write down a free energy sort of in this mean field theory framework. It's kind of trivial to see, you know, this is just your standard energy term. Um, over here, this is your entropy term for, you know, upstates and then downstates. So one plus m, one minus m, that's what tells you what p plus and p minus are. Um, so that's what that is. And then you can sort of play the same game where again, you can, well, I guess there, there's one caveat I need to be careful. Is not only do you now need to sort of go downhill in terms of what your weights are, you also need to minimize it with respect to m now as well. So every time you update the weights, which again, you do the same exact procedure, you calculate the gradient, um, um, you calculate the gradients, um, and then you get the similar expression as before, but now it's in terms of the magnetization. And then after you've updated the weights, you then have to go through and do the same thing um, and sort of playing around with what the uh, various magnetizations are for each of the things. But this is actually much simpler to do because I can do it in like, uh, it's probably not quite right, but like n squared steps, instead of like for each n, you might have to like do a thousand steps or something with the other algorithm with some Monte Carlo to like go through and calculate and have the system reach thermal equilibrium. So it's significantly quicker uh, system to use this method to calculate your weights using this mean field theory, which is just from step. Can you speak up a bit? Like, I guess I guess I'm still not sure what you mean. Um, right. Oh, I see what you're saying. Right. Because okay. Um, I mean, I guess the way that I can say it's correct is when you go and run the algorithm in once. I guess right. So there's we can like. I don't know if I have a good answer theoretically. You know. How correct it is. If there's no structure to the W, there's not really any dimension breaks. The dimension is uh, say like that the coupling term is strong in your state to the number of your state is not a dimension W I J. Well that's true. Or, you know, long range, so it's going to be very hard to do this. I think that makes sense. I guess I don't have a good theoretical explanation, but I think I think what you say makes sense. Uh, Sorry, I don't have a better answer, I guess. Oh, it's kind of weird to Yeah, no, you are. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so that last slide sort of uh, concluded the gold machine aspect of this talk. I just want to sort of, you know, take a step backward and just sort of give people a survey what other people have been thinking about sort of as this core work. You know, most people they do machine learning, right? They just do machine learning, but you know, Stefan and, and I you know, are the first people to think about this. Um, there's you know some very interesting work um, looking at uh, just you know renormalization group type flows actually within neural networks, which is really neat. Um, so you can sort of do a coarse grain of the kernel, basically just you know correlations between the nodes in the architecture of a neural network, and you know, kind of looks kind of like a Cardinal renormalization group kind of thing, you know, sort of similar. Uh, there's more work along these lines as well. Uh, and then also there's some interesting work where people look at infinite width neural networks. I think someone gave a seminar talk on this like a year ago or something. Um, or basically you can sort of come up with these Feynman diagrams when you start to move away from the infinite width neural network, which is kind of neat. Um, and then there's some other work that uh, Stefan and I, um, and also some collaborators, um, a perimeter of Microsoft did where we sort of looked at some interesting mappings between uh, Boltzmann machines, um, specifically restricted Boltzmann machines, gauge theories, and matrix models. Um, and sort of with the notion of, you know, if you could, you know, maybe with the mapping that we were able to find, maybe somehow, you know, physical laws could learn over time to evolve. Um, so there's a lot of really interesting work, you know, where people have, like I said, the last Boltzmann machine example where people have used some theoretical physics to speed up machine learning algorithms. And sort of a lot of these, I guess some of them are still in the machine learning way, but at least in the last direction, trying to go the other direction. Uh, and so, so that's sort of my hope for the talk is sort of, you know, sort of display that, you know, machine learning can be a little bit more useful than just using data. Uh, we can improve that with physics, but maybe 
we could start thinking about it on the other side. Uh, second. I think that would be it. Uh, oh, yeah, um, yeah, this, this guy here. Yeah. So, can you say anything about the uncertainty of your prediction based on the width of this distribution? Uh, will this become a, a, a full width of that direction smaller if the number is more certain? I I don't think so. I think it'll I think it will converge on a, once it's run for long enough, it'll just converge on a nice width because it, it's sampling. It's just sampling a partition function for the system, so it should just converge on something nice. It's not like making some measurement of something. Right? Sure. The system has, you can use that kind of proxy. If you had a bunch of different quantities of very uh, Carrying no count? Yeah, it, it oh, I think. Uh, would you, would you uh, well, that would, that would, of course, change uh, the physics a bit, but I, I assume there'd be a sort of similar, I guess. Uh, there questions? I guess maybe from the interweb, is there any questions? I guess so I'm, I'm not really familiar with using Colton machines or machine learning, and the kind of question is, uh, you know, when you, when you do neural network training, training sort of fast, and you back from gate breaks, right? And the Colton machines at some level kind of look like a standard neural network just for a specific weight. So what exactly is the structure where you end up having to calculate the you know, correlation function instead of just being able to back, uh, back from the gate? That's a good. That's a good question. So what the difference is is um, you're trying to basically right. You're, the gradient you're calculating is different, right? So you're, you're sort of back propagating. I guess you know your your loss function is different, right? In the fully connected neural network. So here it's sort of based on this sort of generative probabilistic you know framework. And so that basically you see like uh, uh, you know you're taking you have to calculate what this average is, but you have to calculate you know what it is when the system is thermally ordered. You know, the system has a temperature, so you know, things aren't quite as deterministic as they are. Now, there's a there's a cheap trick you can do for a restricted Boltzmann machine. So that's the case where it's um, where it's this guy here. So because it's a bipartite graph, it sort of makes training a bit simpler. You can do something called contrast Oh, someone has made a like that. Um, where you wait update. This looks like this. This is this is called contrastive divergence. But H B and H prime B prime is basically all you do is you you know take some uh, input for your visible layer. So say it's an image or a data point. You go through the network. It's literally just W times X, and then you know one over one plus E to the blah. And then you get what your H is, and then you come backward out to the visible layer, and then back in again. And the back out is your B prime. Back in is your H prime. And this is approximating in a very like cheap way. Uh, Basically, just approximating the screen in a very sketchy way, uh, but that works really well. So that's actually, this is normally how people train restricted Boltzmann machines. Because if you do the full method, which is called maximum likelihood learning, you have to do that. You know, do this business from again. This isn't maximum likelihood learning. This is something of their own creation. But again, it's very expensive to explore that entire you know, distribution of reach there. But that's so. It's basically, you're trying to improve the probability. Yeah, I would say that's probably the main problem. Any other questions? Okay, so that adjourns everything. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.